Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Last time we talked about Youngblood, it was the Alan Moore penned miniseries that split Youngblood off into its own universe while creating a mythology and history behind its world. While it had a lot of problems, owing mostly to caring more about establishing a new superhero history for Liefeld's creation than telling that much of a compelling story in its own right, as well as Liefeld's art holding back that story, it was clearly ambitious and showed how Moore, and subsequently other writers, could use pastiches of Marvel and DC stuff to tell stories with those characters without needing to be confined by the same editorial restrictions that Marvel and DC will often have. It was a jumping off point for something new and interesting, and in the hands of a good writer, maybe even Youngblood could be something that would be forever celebrated. Rob Liefeld, however, is not a good writer, to which we are turning back the clock again to early Youngblood stuff to help illustrate that. One of my big criticisms of Volume 1 of Youngblood is that in 10 issues, we barely learn anything about the characters populating the next generation of heroes, focusing instead on action scenes and introducing new characters into that aforementioned generation. And that brings us to Youngblood Strike File, eight issues that tell shorter stories about individual Youngblood members, in particular their backstories. Because why have all that pesky character development in the main book when you can shove it into some something that people have to shell out another few bucks for. This probably helps explain Youngblood's terrible release schedule as well. Liefeld already has a reputation for chronic lateness with his work, but of course you're gonna be late when you're working on multiple comics at the same time. The first issue of Strike File came out between issues 4 and 5 of the regular book. They hadn't even gotten to half a dozen issues and they were already releasing spin-off books. And Image Comics was still very new. They hadn't really proven they could stand the test of time, but they decided to just flood them market with new associated books when they hadn't even given us a reason to care about the team after four issues? But perhaps this is finally what I've been asking for for over a decade of reviewing Youngblood. Character development. Let's dig into Youngblood Strike File number one and see if it's there. The cover is... yeesh. I suppose it makes sense for a book meant to focus on a character would just have a static shot of said character taking up most of the thing and trying to look badass. But of course, the actual effect is, why the hell are we looking at this demon thing and not the character we're supposed to be focused on? Oh, by the way, this is supposed to be Chapel, which I guess given his eventual decision by Youngblood number 10 to try to become a Hellspawn, the demonic look is actually appropriate. But that story wouldn't happen for another year. Plus, this is backstory, not future events. So what the hell? His shoulders are really huge and mostly in shadow. Is he wearing football pads under there or something? And I think those are supposed to be glowing bullet holes on his head and chest, but it could just be that he's so full of Liefeldian rage and is straining his muscles so much that's actually his blood evaporating and leaving his body. First explosive issue! With books like these, it feels like the comic is making a bomb threat against me. Also, get this guy a napkin or something. He's drooling all over himself. We open in another dimension that's only one color per page. Yeah, weird thing with this story. None of the backgrounds have, well, backgrounds. Each page just has a slight gradient color going for it. Only one page is an actual background drawn, and it's like 
a window. I said how tough it must have been to get out the regular book when they're putting out all the spinoffs, but they're not even trying to put in any effort on those either! I should note that Liefeld is not the penciler here, though that should be obvious. He's just one of the two writers on it. No, this art belongs to Jay Lee, and it is ugly as sin already. Murky, leaning too heavily on inks, and really exaggerated physiques. But let's actually get into the story itself. Chapel, personal log entry. It's about six years back. Man, Chapel's taking his sweet time making those log entries. Fits with the procrastinating attitude of Youngblood, I suppose. Times around midnight, the agency located a cybernet safe house on the outskirts of St. Louis. And it's up to Simmons, Duke, and me to shut their operation down before it's completely up and running. Turns out it was just an internet cafe getting set up. Our bad. No, it actually turned out to be a trap. This cybernet, whatever it is, knew they were coming and had an ambush waiting. I guess, anyway. Look, I only know that because that's what Chapel is narrating. The artwork only conveys him shooting at people with that weird alien gun thing with a big sharp pointy blade on top. I mean, you can't even claim it's a bayonet or something. It's like he just stuck a xenomorph tail on top of his gun like it was bling. As we close in on the safe house, we encounter a handful of cybernet agents and use the lot of them for target practice. Is it really target practice when you just shoot so many bullets that the law of averages means some will hit? They enter, and I just realized that for being some super duper secret commando squad, Chapel is leading this group without wearing body armor. Or a shirt. Hell, check it out. The light in this bottom right panel is framed in a way to show off his pecs and abs. Look at my nipples. Look at them! Inside, it's just as I suspected. A wall-to-wall -wall welcoming party. Cybernet style. The balloons were not fully inflated, and the cake already had several pieces cut out of it. The bastards. Not that we mind much. The cake wasn't very good anyway. So no one believes in shirts in this outfit, I see. And now Chapel's ridiculous gun has the weird pointy attachment on the underside of it instead of above. Great continuity! Okay, if there's one thing I can be nice about in regards to the artwork, it's Chapel's makeup or whatever that is. With Liefeld, it always just resembled a kind of skull shape. Fine enough on its own, but Jay Lee's heavy inks really emphasize the makeup, which includes these fangs above and below his lips. It does add a lot and creates a very cool effect. Chapel is still a terrible character, and the overall art is still horrendous, but I'll give credit there. Anyway, the cybernet forces, which are apparently cyborgs according to the narration, are defeated and Chapel demands their leader show his face. Said leader, Geiger, appears as a giant floating hologram head with hair like the Monitor from DC. Weird. I must say, I'm flattered, Chapel. It's not every day Central Intelligence sends its top operatives to pay me a visit. Really? Where are they? Yeah, well, rest assured this ain't no Avon lady Colin Geiger. So I see. Although your continued obsession with that ghoulish makeup would certainly put you in the prime position to work for them as a spokesman. Good, then maybe I'll give him a call after I'm done wiping this place up with your miserable ass. Good that he's thinking about his career prospects. You never know, the job market's always fluctuating and you need to keep your options open. Also, nice censorship on ass there. Wouldn't want to say a naughty word in the comic featuring bloody knives and a line of monstrously drawn people half in silhouette against a red background firing guns. You know, the same kind of thing you'd see on Sesame Street. After some more banter, the three flee the building after realizing the place is rigged to blow. However, two of them, Simmons and Duke, stop for a moment. Simmons is, of course, Al Simmons, who would become Spawn, and he shoots Duke because it turns out he was a traitor who sold them out. Oh no! Not Duke! I couldn't possibly believe Duke would ever turn traitor! I mean, we've known him for so long! Get a load of this artwork of his death. I feel nothing wrong with showing this versus some of the other stuff I haven't shown in comics because it's not even gory, it's just goofy. It kind of looks more like he's shooting a laser out of his mouth while his eyes shoot lightning and I guess some blood is melting off the back of his head. Just terrible. But yeah, Duke is dead. Farewell, Duke. We'll always have the good times. I will remember you 
A few days later, they're in Washington, D.C. for a debriefing with their boss, Wynn, and our single panel of backgrounds. Take a look at Simmons' body here. I guess Jay Lee thought Simmons was supposed to be a woman since he has a massive upper body but a tiny little waist and pipe cleaner legs. Anyway, Simmons was more than happy to kill Duke, but he's unclear what exactly it was that Duke did. You know as well as I do that I'm not permitted to discuss the particulars of Duke's case with you, Al. Let's just say he did his best to amass a considerable body of evidence against himself during the last several months, and leave it at that, shall we? And please, let's try not to dwell any more than necessary. Dissecting Duke's many shortcomings will benefit no one, least of all yourself. Hey, you take that back, asshole! Duke had no shortcomings! He was a saint, and we loved him! We cut to five years later. Chapel has traded in his leather jacket for a big, bulky brown one. He's working with Youngblood instead of Central Intelligence, and Wynn still looks like a pointier Roger Delgado. They've fallen out of favor with each other, but Wynn is still powerful. He has a job for Chapel that he tries to blackmail him into doing, threatening to reveal to the wider public his former illicit activities. But Chapel still refuses to play ball. After he leaves, Wynn grins evilly about how he'll get his vengeance anyway by telling his secretary to call Geiger up. Though I suspect it's to fix that glass painting of Chapel that he has hanging up behind him. Someone shattered it! Normally this would be where I stopped, but as it happens, Strike File is a flip book, meaning there is a second story in here. Actually, there might just be one story because it's hard to call what we just covered a story. The flipbook cover, like the other one, is basically just a shot of a hero, in this case Die Hard, flying through space. Die Hard is one of the other survivors of Planet Ramina. Man, I hate to say this, but Liefeld's art is kind of a breath of fresh air after the first story. Don't get me wrong, it's still bad, but at least the inking is more reasonable and the character has bright primary colors on him. It's just nicer to look at. Ugh, I feel dirty preferring Liefeld's art. I need something to make fun of. Oh, hey, check it out! Apparently Die Hard's wearing some of those plastic Hulk hands. Things are completely fused together. We open in Berlin, 1944, as we see Die Hard and two other superheroes running on what I'm pretty sure is one of those butt hills from the Baby Got Back music video. So, what are they doing? Look out, Axis! Here we come! And immediately this story is a thousand times better than the other one because it involves fighting Nazis. Ten out of ten would recommend... This is actually a flashback being narrated by Glory, the Wonder Woman pastiche we saw in Youngblood Judgment Day. So here's the weird thing. Die Hard here, at least according to her, is not the same Die Hard in Youngblood, but rather a Golden Age version of him. Okay, odd enough, but not unbelievable. Legacy heroes are a thing, and maybe the crotch attack of Youngblood Die Hard is just restricted to his incarnation. But no, the weird thing is the Golden Age Die Hard's mask. It looks like it's just a piece of cloth loosely hanging over his head. That's fine enough, but then we see other angles of him, and it's just his regular mask, but with a weird little capelet thing behind it. I don't know what's going on with that. I think Liefeld just didn't know how to draw the fabric of the mask moving in other directions when it's not skin tight, so he just made this weird little napkin thing attached to the back of the mask. Otherwise, the alternative is that Die Hard wore a skin tight mask, and then put another mask over it for no reason. Anyway, Gloria is narrating about the good old days kicking nazi ass and all that. She talks about Super Patriot, the Superman pastiche, with Die Hard acting as Captain America, as we saw in a previous issue with the rip-off shield, and how she had a crush on him. She says it's because of how noble and pure he was, but I think it had more to do with the giant-ass cape. Look at this thing. It's so big it actually forms the bottom panel of the page. You can give your Fuhrer a message, Nazi. Tell him America isn't about to give up the fight. FOR FREEDOM! Well, no, he can't give that message. I'm pretty sure you broke his spine with that punch. And indeed, Golden Age Die Hard doesn't go for a crotch attack. Instead, having all the Nazis get in a straight line so he can kick them into each other like he was trying to find out if he could make a human Newton's cradle. But yeah, Glory is just happy about all the good times in the past where the three of them beat up lots of Nazis. Which brings us to the present day. The elderly Glory talks about how Super Patriot was assaulted over in the pages of Savage Dragon. Even killed, but his body was saved and upgraded by the Cyber Data Corporation. Ah, Google. Gotcha. 
She's pissed, thinking they're desecrating his body and memory like this, and wants Youngblood's help in taking them down, while also trying to restore whatever humanity is left in Super Patriot. This department couldn't agree with you more, Miss Glory. The government has more than a vested interest in the fate of Super Patriot, having been instrumental in both his design and origin. So what you're saying is, you only care because the department owns the copyright. I'm the government. I'm the government. I'm the reason nothing works. And so our comic ends with Die Hard explaining that they'll deal with cyber data, which has been a thorn in their sides. Their status as a well-known, highly respected corporation has resulted in a long-time standoff between them and previous administrations. Their hands have been tied, and any action against them has been limited. Until now. We will form Facebook and be even better at data collection than them! Kidnapping Super Patriot and altering him against his will is something this administration will not stand for. They want Super Patriot back at any cost, although we may wait for a coupon first. This comic sucks. Part of the problem is that both stories are just setups for, presumably, their continuations in the next issue. I'll grant you this. The Die Hard story, while mostly being fluff with glory, just talking about the good old days, has a premise that's at least a little more compelling. A Golden Age hero twisted by an evil corporation into their tool? That has some meat to it, and while Liefeld's art is still bleh, at least I can tell what's going on and it's bright and colorful like a Golden Age story about punching Nazis should be. Sure, it's all set up, but it's decent set up for what could be a great story. It probably won't be, but it could be. The Chapel story, on the other hand, is just garbage. Garbage pencils with garbage inks and garbage colors. The lack of backgrounds is bad enough, but the writing is just so tedious and weak. Just Chapel self-affirming how awesome he is because... I don't know, because Cybernet is so terrible at what they do? We don't know who Geiger is, or what his deal is, or why we should care about Wynn being allied with him. It's just rough and bad and has nothing of substance to offer. I guess we learn that Chapel has integrity enough to not be controlled by Wynn when threatened, but Chapel's an asshole and a villain, as we saw with Youngblood number 10 and... Well, Spawn's entire backstory, so why should we care about that? Next time, another Patreon-sponsored episode as we dive into a few issues of Black Panther from 2005. Whatever the case, though, I put it out of my mind, as me and the boys kick Operation Night Strike into high gear. We spelled it like night as in a shining night instead of night as in dark, because we really like irony that makes no sense. Hello, my friends. Please be sure to like this video, subscribe, hit the bell, and share it with others. And if you get a chance, maybe check out my Patreon. 